Awesome. Thank you, sir. Sure, thanks. Oh, sorry, it already started. Never mind. Hi, uh, and welcome to the book club on the effect. Today, we're going to be talking about two chapters, uh, namely chapter three on describing variables and then chapter four on describing relationships. Um, and these learning objectives are not really objectives and more questions um, that I tried to put together that are going to be answered in these in this chapter. Um, so. The first part is just reviewing variable types um, of like, yeah, the variables that we can find in the wild. Um, and then it goes on to talk about how these variables are distributed and how we can have a look at that, um, how we can visualize that, and then how we can summarize variables. And that's basically how far it goes because um, we're just describing a single variable. So no relationship there. Um, yeah. So I, I collected a couple of um, quotes from the book because I thought they they were kind of handy. Um, so the, the author says that empirical research questions really come down to entirely to describing the density distribution of statistical variables. So this is really the core of like all of the fancy stuff we're going to do in later chapters. Like we really have to have a look at what our variables look like and what we can get from there. Um, and then he adds a neat uh, description of a variable, um, which is just a bunch of observations of the same measurement. So that could be the height of school ch a child or the amount of air a whale breathes in every day um, or well, whatever work we want to study. Um, but the problem with this variable is that it's a lot of information to take in. So we can't have a look at, I don't know, if we are looking at a thousand school children, that's just too many height. Um, measurements. Um, so we're trying to describe them in a single measure or like at least less than those thousand measurements um, Yeah, to be able to have an overview of the variable. Okay, so there's a couple of different variable types. You've probably all seen these. Um, there's continuous variables, which are variables um, that are measured along a scale. So um, they're, they're not discrete, um, but rather like you can go infinitely small in between two steps. Um, then we have count variables, which we often treat as continuous variables, but they, they have, well, they just go from one to two and there's not 1.5 or 1.5, one, one, two or whatever. Um, but if there's a large amount of counts, then at least researchers often treat them as continuous variables. Then we have ordinal variables. Um, those are variables that are just ordered, but we can't really make sense of the of the distance between two variables. So if you're talking about school types, like, I don't know, elementary school, high school, and then college, like, we don't really know, like, how, how high is the distance between elementary school and high school in comparison to high school and college. That's not really something we can compare in that in, in that meaning. Um, but we can at least order them. So we know that one comes before the next and then the next and then the next. For categorical variables, we, we can't even do that. There's no ordering. Um, so we just have, for example, religions. So we know that there's people who are Catholic or Buddhist um, or we're Muslims, but we can't really order them. They're just different. Um, and then there's a subgroup, which are binary variables or dummy variables. And the neat thing is that we can turn categorical variables into binary variables. So that way we can just play with them more easily. And then lastly, he put in qualitative data as in like text data, for example, if we were to scrape a website and then we just have a bunch of text um, but usually we don't really work with that directly, but rather than try to put it into one of the other variable types again. Yeah, just uh, yeah. I, I yeah, guess please. a couple comments on, on the variables. Like one, one thing I, I noticed he omitted, you know, he talks about count variables, but he doesn't talk about discrete variables that are not necessarily counting, right? Like where you could have negative numbers. Uh, so this is not really an exhaustive, list um just kind of 
scan through like an introductory stats book on my bookshelf. And, and it'll, sometimes they talk about interval level uh, variables where, um, you know, there, you can infer equal intervals, uh, you know, between, between levels there, but there's no true zero. Um, so like examples would be temperature at Fahrenheit or Celsius, um, IQ scores, things like that. And sometimes you see ratio level uh, variables, right, where um, you do have a true zero. Um, examples would be height, age, weight, uh, temperature, if you're measuring in like a Kelvin scale. Um, so yeah, just, uh, it, this is not a completely exhaustive list is, is my point there. Uh, the, the qualitative uh, description was, was new to me too. He's just like, like, this is like a bag of words and this is how you convert it to one of these other data types. Um, uh, and then uh, just a couple other notes I wrote, like he doesn't talk about context of modeling, um, you know, because we could kind of go there too, right? Like dependent variable versus independent, exogenous uh, versus endogenous variables, uh, stochastic uh, versus like a constant or deterministic type variable. Um, we could really go down the rabbit hole with this kind of stuff if we wanted to. I, uh, before reading these two chapters, I'm evaluating a textbook for an undergraduate class at the like 200 level for business analytics. And I felt that was a little bit more advanced than here. But what I really liked about this is a very good, more conversational approach to like why, why this is like kind of breaking down. Hey, these are fancy terms, but like, you know, he says basically why, what is a variable? We kind of define that more in general terms, kind of just as a refresher and how that generally applies. But I did also like, um, I think this is the clearest way I've ever seen with the categorical variables at the end where he talks about when there's one a group where it's yes or no here, yes or no here, but you can also handle where they're in two separate groups together without getting too complicated about like encoding or um, things like that. So I think it's, it is a really good background for someone who either needs a refresher or um, is new to it and doesn't get overwhelmed with all the math and everything else going behind it. Yeah, for sure. Any more comments? Okay. So I, I think most of this chapter is just a review, but I feel like it's actually really helpful to just think about these basics every once in a while. Um, sure. Yeah so, the, yeah. so the next thing he talks about is distributions of these variables. Um, and what it is, um, which, I didn't really think about that much. So I just copied this in here. A variable's distribution is a description of how often different values occur. And then if we have different types of variables, there's just different ways to visualize that. So if we have like a categorical or an ordinal variable, which is just not continuous, we can just do a table um, with percentages or a frequency table or a bar chart. So there's not really a, a graph per se, which is just nice and continuous that we can do. It's more a bar chart and that, that's it. Um, if we have continuous variables, we can either do a histogram, which is basically the same as this bar chart that we can do for the categorical or ordinal variables. Um, but we just have those bins that we can decide on ourselves how, how small or large they're supposed to be. Um, or we can do a density plot, which is, kind of like a histogram if we just imagine the bins to be super, super, super tiny. Um, and there's just handy because then we can say the probability of having a variable in a certain range. Um, and we can just have that in a neat little plot like this one. Okay. Then I'm just gonna go on to summarizing this distribution because it's nice to have like a, a graph, but it's even nicer to just have like single figures that we can work with because we are gonna have a lot of variables and then, yeah, it's just easier to deal with them if we just have a couple of, um, of single points uh, for a variable. Um, yeah, that's basically what I said. Um, so this is actually, like the mean percentiles inter quarter range variation in SKU are actually like all part of the distribution, but I just like, I didn't want the slides to be super long. So I split them up. Um, 
So really just a review, we have the mean, which is our sentiment tendency, and it's a representative value of like the one value that's like kind of in the middle. Um, but the problem is um, he, he had this um, example of a lot of people being in a room and we have their mean um, income and then Jeff Bezos walks into this room and the mean is just like skyrocketing just because of this one person. So, I mean, it. So the mean is handy, but it can be very um, sensitive towards like extreme values, which is why percentiles are nice. Um, so we we don't consider everything together. We're just saying, ah, okay. So if we put all of these people in the room and like line them up by their uh, income, then the median would be the person right in the middle there. And then it doesn't really matter as much anymore if Jeff Bezos walks into the room or not, we just still have the same person in the middle. Um, so he, he puts together these different percentiles. We have the medium, we have the minimum, we have the maximum. Um, we, can, we can just take any percentile we want to, but I think those are the most frequent ones. And then in what's, yeah, this just goes along with the percentiles. We have the interquartile range which is the, the distance between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And that's just something handy because we know it's exactly half of the distribution and exactly the half of the distribution that's in the middle. So hopefully not too many outliers in there. Um, yeah. uh, just a comment about percentiles. I, I went down the, the rabbit hole a little bit and this is something that's always bothered me uh, there is no real standard definition of percentiles. Um, and depending on what software package you're using, you may get a different answer. Uh, it, it, just to give you a real basic example, if you're familiar with Excel, uh, there's a, an inclusive and an exclusive percentile. Um, the exclusive uh, definition would prevent you from getting like a zero or a one uh, for, for a percentile, whereas inclusive, you you based on your sample, you could get a, a zero or one value. Um, and I went under the hood a little bit in R, uh, there's the quantile function. So if you're an R user, you probably used that before for calculating percentiles. And uh, the default uh, way that, that that percentiles are calculated is consistent with what would be the inclusive percentile in, in Excel. So you can get, based on your sample, a value between zero and one. Um, but there are nine different versions <laughs> of percentiles that you can actually kind of toggle off and on within that quantile function. So if you wanted the exclusive version, that's a type six in, in R. Um, and then, you know, in my line of work in insurance, uh, you know, a lot of times we calculate percentiles just as a cumulative distribution function. Um, and that's a type one in, in R. Um, so that's probably more than you guys wanted to know. But uh, yeah, it, it, uh, there are a lot of different um, versions of percentiles. And um, I'm going to put in the chat here... Uh, this paper by, I think, Ron Heinemann, he's the guy that wrote Forecasting Principles and Practice. He um, details um, these nine different ways to calculate uh, percentiles. Um, and, you know, they all have different properties and depending on what you're trying to achieve, you might want one versus the other. Um, and it just, I, I think to, to summarize all of this, if you have a small sample size, you could get very different uh, you know, percentile cal calculations. So you need to look out for that. Plus if you're calculating percentiles, you know, on the lower end uh, or higher end, like the 95th percentile, even if you have a large sample, you might get drastically different values uh, depending on which definition you're using. So. Yeah, I think he also goes back to this uh, a bit later when he talks about um, uh, summarizing it when you, when you have subsets like when you have conditional means and then he's like, okay, yeah, well, if we do something conditional, then it actually does make sense to take the mean because we just have a subsample. And then if we only have three observations and we're trying to take the 95th percentile, that just gets more difficult. Yeah. 
Yeah, I found uh, like the, the median, for instance, uh, I think it tends to be pretty consistent across the definitions. But once you again, you go out to the tails, um, you know, the way things are interpolated, for instance, are just going to be different. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay. So another way to think about variables is not like um, certain points across the across the distribution, but like talking about variation. So yeah, I mean, it's in the word how much a variable varies. Um, and I like the spot that he has in his book where we see um, this super high peak in the middle and that's just very low variation because most is around zero. Um, and then the more variation we get, the fatter the tails become and the less high this peak is in the middle. Um, and so variation is just basically measuring how wide a distribution is. Um, and yet this neat example of number of children versus number of eyes, where if we're talking about the yes, for example, maybe the number of children per uh, woman is about two on average. So there's some who have like four kids or maybe six kids and some people who don't have any kids. Um, but yeah, on average, it's about two. Um, and then he also talked about the number of eyes, which just doesn't vary as much. So there may be some people, or I mean, most people have two eyes. And then maybe some people only have one or zero. And there may be people who have three, but definitely not as many people who have like three kids. Um, so the variation, even though the mean for both of these is exactly the same, is going to differ a lot between those two variables. Um, and we can we can measure this variation with variance. Um, I didn't put the mathematical definition in there because you probably all know it. Um, but if, what I thought was nice is he, he talked a bit about the variance and how it's squared because we're basically trying to take the, yeah, it's squared. Um, so we can't really use it directly when we're trying to compare something. So that's why we use the standard deviation, which is the square root of it. And then we again have the same unit of the variable that we were originally working with. And there's makes things a lot easier because I wouldn't know what's, what the number of children squared means. like. That's just a bit harder to, to interpret. Okay. And then the third way of thinking about how to describe a variable um, is the skew or skewness. Um, and here we see a distribution, which is just very left skewed. So there's these outskirts um, to the right where we just have people who have a super high income, but most people don't. Um, so that way it doesn't look like a nice um, normal distribution with like the peak in the middle, um, but it's scoot to the left. Um, and he talks about two ways how we can handle it because usually we kind of want symmetric um, distributions because those are just easier to handle. Um, so if we don't have any zeros or no zeros that we care about, we can just lock the distribution, the variable, and then the distribution gets a bit more towards um, a normal distribution. And it's it has a nice interpretation as well. That's super nice about logging. Uh, and if we do have zeros, uh, but no negative values, and we care about the zero, we can use the oh, asymmetric. What, what, what's it in long again? I always forget. Um, inverse hyperbole her hyperbolic sign, that's the thing. Um, so we can use that, but it doesn't go with a nice interpretation that logging variables does. Okay. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, comments. I mean, w whenever we're dealing with financial matters, it's always right skewed, right? <laughs> that's just, uh, in my experience, it, right? If you're dealing with money, it's, it's gonna be right skewed. Um, and just a, a note on, the log transform, it, it always seems like that's a key recommendation when you have these, these severely right skewed variables. Um, I will say, you know, working in insurance, you have right skewed distributions as well, claim sizes. Um, but a lot of times I, I don't care about the log of money or of a claim size. I, I care about the actual, uh, you know, the, the, the value on the, on the raw scale 
And, and so if you're performing a regression on the log dependent variable, and then you try to back transform it at the end, you're really predicting the median and not the mean. And I'm interested in the mean. So it's, it's not always so simple. Uh, it, it doesn't always make your life easier uh, when you do take the log. And so, you know, there's a something out there called a smearing estimate where you can try to back into the mean once you, you've log transformed it, you know, you multiply your, your regressions estimate by a, a constant that you also have to solve for. Um, but it, it adds more complexity. So I just wanted to point that out there. It's like, you always see, uh, you know, log, the log transformation is, is, is making your life simpler, but that's not always the case. And in, in, in my experience, sometimes it makes it, uh, harder. Um, and those smearing estimates to try to back into the me mean from the median doesn't always work out that well, um, in the, in the real world. So I don't know if anyone else has had an experience with that, but, um, yeah, just curious, you mentioned you had yeah. one of the mean on this, on the very skewed data set and that kind of was brought up in here about usually you would want the median. I was just curious what the use case there was. I thought there was uh, some commentary in the book that, you know, the median is really a typical observation. Uh, but, you know, if you're talking insurance, right, setting an appropriate premium for something, you want to make sure that you, the premium is right on average so that your company can remain solvent. So whether or not you can predict the median appropriately does not matter. You need to, you, you need to get the, uh, the mean, right. Right. Cause then you, you multiply that out by your enrollment, you get, you get like the total premium, right. You, you just, it, right. So that's, that's more important than, than getting it right on a typical basis. Even with like confidence bands or uh, in, like uh, high, low, uh, like a 66 percentile, 33 percentile, it's still, I, I just don't know anything about insurance. So I was just curious just because um, that was mentioned in yeah, that that's right. I mean, you wanna you wanna get get right on average, right? And then <laughs> usually introduce some conservatism there, but but yeah, the uh, the mean is more important than the the median uh, when it when it comes to uh, like pricing for insurance. Yeah, it's, it would be nice if it was all easy and clean. Um, yeah. I don't have a smooth transition to the next slide, but I'm just going to go ahead anyway. Um, so we just talk about like the, the distribution of the data that we have collected, which is a sample, which is just this tiny window into the actual world. Um, and we want to use this tiny window into the actual world to like figure out what that looks like um, since we don't have the resources um, to collect all of the data that would be necessary to figure out what the world works like. Um, so we have the reality from our sample, but we really want the truth. What we really want from that is the truth. Um, and that truth is the theoretical distribution. So we have like our real distribution from the sample that we have, but from that we want to like infer what the, what the theoretical distribution is. Just a bit of notation. And I thought that was actually really nice because I've never had it like this broken down. Um, so whenever there's English or Latin letters, it's just data. And when there's like a hat on top of that or like a, a squiggly thing, that's the calculations with the real data. And then anything that's Greek, that's the truth. And then we have modifications of that. That's our estimation of the truth. So where we're trying to get from our data to the truth. Um, yes. So the theoretically, Oh, the theoretical distribution, and um, that's what generated our data. It's also called the data generating uh, process. Um, and I think there's another word for it, but I mean, that's just basically like we're trying to get to where our data actually came from. Um, and we're never really gonna get there because we can't collect all of it, but we can get good enough. Um, and I like this quote where he says, the bigger our number of observation gets, the good or enough it will come. So like, it's it's not perfect, but it's it's good enough. So you can see here with 10 observations, it's probably not gonna be great, but we if we get towards a thousand observations, then we're gonna get closer and closer to the truth. At least if we care about like 
making your representative and random and these things that we are not going to cover in the book. And then there's just a really small line about how we can use hypothesis testing to check if our distribution could come from the hypothetical distribution that we think we might come from. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have on this chapter. There are some homework questions. So we could go over those now, or we could do it together with chapter four. What would you guys prefer? Uh, maybe let's see how much time we have, because uh, I see we've already kind of burned through the first 30 minutes. Um, and if we have time, maybe we can look at chapter three homework for, yeah. or chapter That's four. That's kind of done discussion throughout, so I think we did pretty well while talking through some concepts. Sweet. And I'll just jump to chapter four. Um, and here we don't just have one variable, which we just talked about, but we have two variables. And then it gets a bit more interesting because we're trying to describe the relationship that at least two variables can have with each other. And that can be like positive or it can be negative or it can be no relationship at all. Um, so we're gonna have a look at what a relationship actually is um, on conditional distributions um, and talk about regressions as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my mouse. Okay, so what, what is a relationship? A relationship is we have two variables and when you learn about one of those variables, that's gonna tell you about something about the other variable. It doesn't mean that one causes the other, um, but for example, if we have a look at children and we know how old they are, we can have an educated guess about how tall they are. That doesn't mean that one causes the other, it might just be a background variable, but at least they, they have a relationship with each other. Um, and it doesn't just have to be a positive relationship or a negative relationship. It could also be a positive relationship that at some point of time turns a null relationship or that turns negative or that becomes even more positive. So there's a lot of different possible combinations. Um, and one way to start with this is just if you have two variables to just plot a scatter plot, because you, then you at least get an idea of what the relationship might look at look like. Um, so you get all of the information at the same time. Um, and then we just talked about having all of the information at the same time. That's a lot. Um, so again, we're trying to like reduce this information a bit and put it into a way that might be more manageable. Um, so that's why we're looking at conditional distributions. And it basically tells us, well, we, we can have an educated guess about what one variable, about the value of one variable. Um, but if we learn about another variable, what that value is, then that might help us with the original variable to, to figure out what that is. So the, the example he gave in the book is that if we're meeting a new person, there's probably about a 50-50% um, chance that they're a, a male. But if they introduce themselves and they call themselves Sarah, then the probability lowers itself that this is going to be a male. Like, I mean, it still could be, but most of the Sarahs out there are women. Um, so that just, yeah, that's just basically a conditional distribution. Um, yeah. And then just as before, we can have a distribution and then we can like try and summarize that again into just a single value like mean. Um, and as I said before, the means are just kind of handy because once we're getting conditional, that means that our subsample is getting smaller and smaller and then means are just easier to work with than the 95th percentile, for example. Um, another, yeah. So an alternative to like making a mean uh, would be to, to plot a locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. So that's not really a point estimate anymore, but we get like a, a line where we can figure out how exactly do these um, two variables uh, agree with it or like how do they correlate with each other? Um, but it's a non-parametric version. So we don't do any regression or anything. We just see how they're correlated. Okay. 
And then the next thing going from that that we can do is to fit a line or a regression. Um, and with this line, we're trying to describe the relationship um, between those two variables, even maybe for uh, points where we don't have any data. Um, and what's nice about it is that it's clear, it's either positive or negative, or just a null. So we just, it's a bit easier to handle. Um, and the results are a bit more precise since we're using all of the data. So instead of just saying, ah, okay, what is the probability if this person is female um, or if the, if the name is Sarah or whatever, we can just use all of the data that we have available. The problem with a line is that we have to pick the shape. Um, so we have to decide on whether it's going to be linear or squared or a log um, or any other form. We can actually use OLS for this because we can transform our variable. We just have to have linear coefficient. Um, but another option would just be to go without an OLS regression um, and then with a maximum likelihood function where we could just assign any function that we would want. Um, and then in with this, I find that kind of interesting. He says, oh yeah, but so we don't have to fit a line. We could also just go with the Pearson correlation coefficient um, since we want to have something where it's clear whether the relationship is positive or negative, we just want one number. So the correlation coefficient also gives us that because it's like somewhere between negative one and one. And then the closer it gets to the extremes, the more clear the relationship is. Uh, yeah, and speaking of uh, correlation coefficients, if you're doing a simple what, bivariate regression, uh, the R squared is literally the Pearson correlation squared. Um, and that's not true if you don't have an intercept or you have, if it's a if it's multivariate regression, but in the simple bivariate case, there's a, that, that nice uh, association there. Yeah, I thought that was always super neat. Okay. Just one more slide. So this is, about conditional conditional means, and this is actually not a typo, which I first thought it was. Um, so, and, and I mean, the other way to say this is that we're just using a control, uh, which I think most of us are more used to. So we've talked about having conditional means before. So for example, me coming up to somebody, greeting them, and they're telling me that their name is Sarah, I'm guessing that the, really, uh, the, the probability just becomes higher that they're actually a woman. Um, and then we can even do this conditional on being at a girl's boarding school, for example. And then the probability might even rise higher, right? So we're, we're putting this conditional mean into another conditionality um, and that just uh, yeah, makes it a bit easier um, to, to figure out what the value of our dependent variable is going to be. Um, so I think this is just a, a different way of thinking about why we put in controls into our uh, regressions. And then he just has this nice picture where um, I think we're controlling on Z. And then, sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, so we're first controlling on Z. And then we are taking out all of the variation that comes from the Z. And then that leaves us with the X residual and the Y residual. And if there's still like a correlation between that, we can say, oh, okay, that's not just coming from our Z, but there's actually something going on between our two original variables. Yeah, I, I know I've, I've seen this in the past, but I, I had to, read this through a couple times. Uh, I, I think the main point here is that, you know, if you're doing, you know, a multivariate regression, what what's, you know, this stuff is kind of happening automatically, right? Where you're teasing out the effects after controlling for those other other variables. But uh, the procedure he's, he's talking about here, it just, <laughs> it, it's kind of confusing, right? Where, where you, you, it feels very, very manual. Um, uh, the steps here um, to uh, to factor out those other variables. Whereas again, in the OLS uh, 
normal equations, I think they're called, right? To, to get there, it's, it's kind of happening automatically behind the scenes. Yeah. We, don't, we don't really think about the, the procedure here. Okay. That's all I have on chapter four. Um, so if you want to, we could just have a look at the homework um, and talk about it a bit together. Or you could end early, whichever works better for you. Lots of good uh, dialogue in the <laughs> in the chat right now too. That's just me not being able. Um, to. <laughs> uh, I it's it's the multiplication sign because usually I see them next to each other when I was looking at it. It, it was separate yeah. symbol, and I just thought they were the same. Yeah, we're talking about expectation. Yeah, I was just kind of really on trying to understand on that. Uh, it, it, is expectation kind of the same thing as probability? Are they interchangeable? Or are they mathematically different? Um, and, that, and basically, what I was uh, kind of looking at was like what it would mean if you know the, they were independent. They would still. What does that mean for linearity? And they still would have some sort of linearity, but that would be, from my understanding, would mean if they're they are actually independent, then there may not be that kind of causality, but then I see that what was sent was a uh, plus here, which would be slightly different without that multiplication. Yeah, yeah, certainly uh, you have two variables, you, you know, the expectation of, of, it would only be true that you could take the, the separate expectations for each variable, and multiply them together if they were independent. And, you know, going back to the insurance example, a lot of times we do assume insureds are independent of each other, even though that's that's a fiction. It's a convenient fiction because the math is just so much easier. Yeah, I guess I just I'm not being insurance. I'm thinking because otherwise you have to take into consideration all these covariances that are, are can be difficult to measure. The um, uh, Jeff Bezos example where it was like the average income was 16 million, like if you all were going to use the average for a financial product that only actually is that high because of one person versus actually that thing. Like, I, I guess that's kind of where I got th uh, thrown off of like, when you mentioned it was very skewed data for what you were working on. That was kind of my thinking on that one. Yeah. I mean, if you think again, going to, to insurance, uh, you know, the median claim might be zero, <laughs> right? more than 50% of your folks don't have a claim in a year. Whereas, you know, the Jeff Bezos analog and in insurance could be, uh, you know, I don't know, $50 million or something like that. So yeah, you, you need to make sure your expectation, your, your mean, you're projecting the, the mean. Uh, my, if, my, you're, if you're just starting with, with the median and you multiply that out in aggregate, you, you might not have enough premium to pay your claims. Fair enough. I guess my, my, the question in my mind was basically given that they had a claim but then again like you said it was i was assuming that a claim meant there was a payout but it, given that it was a claim that was not denied or zero that was kind of what i was thinking so i put some assumptions in there that weren't actually there yeah yeah but e e even even so you still need to it, it's still about the the mean uh or the math doesn't work out you, so you do have to account for that skew um you can't you can't just ignore it or mathematically, like you're, you, know, <laughs> you may be ruined as a as a company. Good thing I'm not insurance. Or maybe good for the people who are insured. I don't know. I took one class in undergrad, and I was like, "Yeah, this is not for me." I see Derek has a point about zero inflated data too, which is, yeah, that always seems to be a problem uh, with, with data that we're, we're dealing with, right? Like Poisson distribution uh, is great, right? From, from a theoretical standpoint, but in reality, you usually end up with more zeros than what a Poisson would, would predict. And so then you kind of like move move to like a negative binomial, but even then you, you still might not have an, you still might not be accurately capturing what you're seeing. So um, yeah, it feels like there are zero inflated 
uh, variance to like a lot of the common statistical distributions that we see out there in textbooks. There's something also not on the this kind of standpoint, but like on data quality checks coming in through data coming in, like understanding the, the relevance of zero values um, and whether or not that meets the thresholds of either the data contract or uh, something to even begin. So that's something that's not just a business use case, but also on an actual data contract uh, standpoint of is this data meeting the needs that we need for it. All right. So yeah, should we? I, I'll, I'll be honest, Sarah. I, yeah, maybe look at a couple of those homework problems. I, I can't say I didn't glance at those, but happy to look at a couple if we think that will stimulate some interesting conversation. So this is, um, yeah, this is just on describing variables. I don't know. Um, I, I think these are pretty basic. Maybe we'll just head right for the relationship stuff. Um, Oh no, these are these are the questions. And so we we talked about like a scatter plot being helpful in the beginning to like try and figure out what the relationship is between two variables. So here we see a scatter plot uh, for income on depression. Um, yeah, how does the conditional mean of depression change as income increases? Yeah, and I, I think we, we learned without controlling for other variables, these, this can be very misleading, uh, right? Which is, which is why, yeah, it's helpful to look at this stuff from an exploratory standpoint, but you, you might not be getting the true relationship, just, just looking at it in its raw state. Um, but ignoring that issue, which I think a lot of this book is about, right? Kind of controlling for those con confounding relationships. Um, yeah, I mean, this, I think about, you know, I kind of want to fit a line to this data and that, and regression is all about conditional distributions. Um, you know, given my X value is $60,000, you know, what is, what is the distribution of depression? And, um, you know, if we're using basic OLS, the assumption is that, you, you know, if you have that um, sigma uh, parameter, right, which would just say that, um, yeah, your variance is, is kind of the same across the board, regardless of what, what level of your um, predictor you're, you're talking about there. Um, but we know that's, that doesn't re reflect reality in a lot of cases, right? So, you have a lot of like GLMs that would assume, you know, your variance actually increases potentially as 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 you kind of go in one direction on, on your predictors. But um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering the question here, but but yeah, I, I mean, I think regression is about conditional distributions, right? It's it's all about conditional on what are my predictor values. You know, here's here's my expected here's my expected target value and here's the expected distribution uh, based based on the value of the, the predictor. Yeah. I agree. And I think the one thing we should probably take from this book is that it's it's probably not causal if we haven't really thought about it very hard and try to figure out yeah. how exactly we could show it's causal. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I think this one might be interesting because I actually had no idea how to answer that. Um, so it's it's talking about line fitting methods and calculating local means. And if we're comparing those two, why we would use one over the other. 
Yeah. I mean, um, no, that's that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think the advantage of of not using a local regression is that you just you have more data points uh, that are kind of informing what you're doing, uh, right? Whereas the well, I guess that's true of of like low S too. You can kind of <laughs> change, like, you know, what the universe of points you're looking at is. But I think in general, you're not looking at every point. For, for figuring out where the what the curve looks like at a, a certain area, right? It's 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 it, you literally are just looking at a a neighborhood, if you will. Um, so so there's something to be said for using all of the data. Um, you're more likely to capture noise, I guess, is is the point. On the downside, of course, is if you have a nonlinear relationship and you didn't think about it ahead of time, like, hey, I need to put a quadratic term in here. You, you know, you may have a really poor poor fit. Just trying to fit a straight line or a plane to your data. So it's any, basically any about like there? noise versus true shape of the relationship. It's, yeah, it's the bias variance uh, trade off, yeah. right? It's signal versus noise. Yeah. Y yeah, you may you may be fitting oh, fitting to the noise if you're if you you're taking that local approach. But that may be good or bad. I, I know when I'm doing exploratory uh, charts, just doing EDA, like I, I typically fit kind of kind of how R does by default with GM Smooth. Like I, I usually put a low, you know, lowest curve on there. I like to see the nonlinearities, at least what's suggested by the data. I don't necessarily take that as, you know, the truth or gospel, but it, it's still helpful from um, when, when you're just looking at your data for the first time. Yeah, that makes sense. If anyone has any other thoughts on that. What about um, time series data where the trends change like pre-COVID, post-COVID? Um, that mm -hmm. seems to be one where the relationship has changed. It's not a stationary relationship over time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's huge, right? Uh, I feel like most industries were impacted by COVID to a degree. It's certainly, again, coming from my my domain expertise in insurance. Yeah, things are very different. Um, and yeah, uh, a local regression may, if, if you're using that for the time series, yeah, would, would, would probably pick up on that uh, uh, automatically to a degree. Whereas uh, you'd probably be getting a, if you're just fitting a straight line, it probably wouldn't fit your data very well at all. Yeah, because I see like, you know, when they see the, the longer term ones of like, I don't know, house prices from like 1900 to now, like that's more of that kind of general linear shape. But when you start to get smaller and smaller, you can see more of that need for just not a line through there. And I think about trying to tie this back to causality. There's a, an approach out there called interrupted time series, um, which is basically like, you know, you have a, a, a policy, like maybe a public policy and, and, and like, um, a new law is enacted and you want to see how human behavior changes after, right, that a new law is enacted and, and you can kind of see that in the time series before and after. Um, you know, a simple approach there would be you you could just have, um, you could fit two separate regression lines before and after the event. Um, you can have a dummy variable to indicate like this is after, you know, this, this major event took place. Um, and you may be able to do something similar if you're you're modeling right the effect of COVID on on whatever you're you're modeling there. Of course, COVID wasn't just a point in time, so you'd have to think through that depending on how granular you're getting with with what time period you're looking at. Yeah, because I think like uh, for example, like trading volumes for the stock like pre and post when like Windows ninety five came out, and then again with the tech bubble, like it's a lot more volume, a lot. Um, you know, it's like. Prior to that point, like there's a point in time that they're caught that, that definitely changes. So that, that's good to know. Do you have any specific books or recommendations, or are they usually tied in with just general time series topics? I I had a use case uh, at a prior role where I needed to do an interrupted time series, and, and there is a course on edX uh, that was pretty helpful, and I think I. Blaze through the whole thing in like 
couple weeks. Um, I'll put in the link here. It did cost money, but I thought it was like 50 bucks at the time. And I found it to be really useful and it was done in R. And so there was code that you could use. And I, 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 I you know, I pretty much borrowed some of that stuff. Um, let me, yeah, let me put that in the chat here. Um, my understanding is, I think we're going to be talking about a regression discontinuity and interrupted time series is, is a subset of that. And I don't, don't really know much about regression discontinuity, but, but again, it's, it's kind of a similar topic from what I've heard. So, yeah. Okay. Looking at the time, I would just like close the shared screen. Um, are you sure? Do, do you want to take over, John? Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, Sarah. And uh, we had a lot more engagement and discussion this time, so which is great. And I, I think as we start progressing more, we'll see what's best about the, how much presentation versus discussion. Um, just went to my first Toastmasters meeting the other day and it kind of made me thinking like, as we're like, one of the reasons why I wanted to facilitate was to work on my communication skills and everything. Is that something you all would be interested in like providing not only like about the book, but like the presentation kind of feedback or something, just like the last few minutes, like things like you did well, might need assistance or clarification on, or is that something beyond what any of us want to deal with? I was just curious if that was something that would be helpful since seems like a lot of us are going into some sort of more out presenting and so on. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, if, if, if you all wanted to kind of build in like a way to provide feedback to each other, on not just the talking through the book, but also like presentation, like, you know, I don't know, like I, 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 I start a lot to speak too fast sometimes, things like that, that just could be something we could take moving forward. Like, I, again, we don't have to, I was just curious if that would be a benefit or if anyone had any interest in that, um, like in the last few minutes of each time or the next time around or just something sent in Slack or something. It doesn't have to be formal. Um, I would say that's not the, the, the focus for me in particular, but if I um, screw something up royally, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe put something in the Slack channel. I don't know if I want that out there on YouTube. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm not about, you know, you don't have about this math anymore. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah Aaron, you, you really blew that presentation. Uh, yeah. Well, I didn't mean it to be awful, negative, you know, like constructive, like, hey, you know, this would, <laughs> for example, one, the one last time I was like, I had mentioned that I had to that able ability to scroll. I thought that was good, but then found out that I, if that gets transferred over, it would have split. It would have been just straight up cut off. So that was something that would have been uh, some feedback I, I would have liked to have known if that was a case. That's something I did on there wasn't going to work well in R or something. But um, as on a presentation side, that's not like saying, "Oh, you messed up," but more of like, "Hey, FYI, you lose half your presentation if you have to scroll through it." Um, so. Uh, I don't know. Feel free to uh, tell me I always mess up, but again, just for me, I'm I'm learning the skills, but I also want to learn the communication skills, which is a huge part of any kind of data is, is sure. being able to tell the data yeah, story yeah. in a way for the audience to understand. So, um, but I don't want to put anyone on a spot or make them feel like they're you know you know feel like they're gonna get you know outed on YouTube or something. But now this was a great time, um, and. Uh, I don't know if it would be helpful to have dialogue during the week or just keep it through once we meet here, but uh, next week, Aaron, you will be presenting just chapter five, which apologize, don't have uh, identification. Have you looked through that at all to provide a little bit more context of what that means? Uh, I, I have skimmed through the chapter. It's not particularly short. I, I will say the chapter after that is, so I, I don't know if we're going to have time to get to chapter six next week, although I, I think you could probably present chapter six um, pretty quickly. Like you could probably do that in a half hour, even though it's it may be a, kind of a new topic for, for some of us. Um, but but yeah, so I, I'm going to plan on just five. But if, if we do run short, I, I can also 
go through six. So I, I, I don't know if, if I, that means I should take both chapters because <laughs> uh, I can. Um, You're going to read it eventually. If, so if, if, you have the time to include it. That works. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll tentatively put myself in for five and six. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, and again, it's informal. So if you're like, you know, I got busy, uh, that's fine. But thank you all for your time. And uh, uh, we'll talk next week at either chapter five and or chapter five and six. So uh, we'll go from there. But have a great week and uh, thank you for attending and uh, see you next week.